Hey everybody, my name is Eric Jospe, and today I'm going to be talking about a couple of topics, um, both math related. The first is going to be equivalence classes, and the second is going to be the field of formal quotients. All right? When we're talking about equivalence classes, we have to talk about equivalence relations. An equivalence relation is just a binary relation satisfying three properties for all A, B, and C in the set X. The first property is what we call a reflexive property. So for all A in the set X, A is going to be equivalent to A. All right. Our second property is just our symmetric property to where for all A and B in the set X, if A is equivalent to B, then B is going to be equivalent to A. And then our third property is our transitive property to where if A is equivalent to B and B is equivalent to C, then A is going to be equivalent to C. So again, these are our three properties that must be satisfied in order for us to have a true equivalence relation. All right, when we're talking about equivalence relations, they generally appear in this form. Um, it's where we have something is equivalent to something else when blank or something happens. All right, and we generally use this squiggly line, um, which is called a tilde, to indicate that two things are going to be equivalent to each other. All right, an example of an equivalence relation that we're going to be working with um, shortly is for all a and b in the set z, um, which is a set of integers, a is going to be equivalent to b when a minus b is on in 3z. All right. Um, the main point of this is to talk about equivalence classes. So when we're talking about equivalence classes, we're talking about just a natural grouping of elements that are related to one another based on an equivalence relation. And what we're really doing when we're creating these equivalence classes is we're partitioning the set, meaning that each of our partitions are disjoint, um, but they contain the entire set. All right? An intuitive example that I want you to think about is take the set of all cars. All right? So any car that um, you may have in your driveway, or that you see on the street in the dealership, any car that's ever been made is in the set of all cars. We can break our this set of all cars down into different equivalence classes based on the color of the car. We can partition this set based on the color. All right? And when we do this, we're creating our different equivalence classes. And our equivalence relation is that um, car A is going to be equivalent to car B when the two cars have the same color. So if I look at one car, um, it's going to be equivalent to itself. If I take one green car and I have another green car, um, car one is going to be equivalent to car two, and car two is going to be equivalent to car one. And then the third, that our transitive property is also satisfied to where if I have car one is green, car two is green, um, and those are equivalent, and then car two is green and car three is green, those are both equivalent. So car one must be equivalent to car three. All right, so that's just an intuitive example to show that our three properties of an equivalence relation have been satisfied using the set of all cars and partitioning that set based on color. All right, the example that we're going to be working with, like I mentioned before, is for all A and B in the set Z, A is going to be equivalent to B when A minus B is in 3Z. All right, and our job and our goal for this is going to be to partition our set into our different equivalence classes based on the equivalence relation that we've been given. So the equivalence relation that we're working with is for all A and B in the set Z, A is going to be equivalent to B when A minus B is in the set 3Z. Our set 3Z contains integers such as negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, and positive 6, and will go on to infinity in both the positive and negative direction by either adding or subtracting uh, 3 to its previous integer. All right, so that's our set 3Z. Now we want to contain our different, or um, create our different equivalence classes based on the equivalence relation that we're given. So the first equivalence class that I'm going to create um, is the equivalence class that contains the integer of 0. The other integers that are in this equivalence class are integers such as 3, 6, negative 3, negative 6, and negative 9. We'll go on to infinity in each direction. And if you notice, this, is, this equivalence class is the same thing as our set 3z. And all this means is that within this equivalence class, we could choose any integer for a or b and plug that into our formula of a minus b, and we're always going to end up in the set 3z. 3 minus 0 is going to give us 3. 6 minus a negative 3 is going to give us a positive 9. So we're always going to end up in the set 3z. However, this equivalence class does not contain all the integers in our big set of integers. One that it doesn't contain is everyone's favorite non-zero number, which is 1. 
The equivalence class that one is a part of also contains integers such as 4, 7, negative 2, negative 5, and so on. So this is now a different equivalence class to where if we take any two of these integers and plug them in for a or b, we'll find that when we subtract a minus b, we're still going to end up in the set 3z. However, if you notice, we still have not accounted for all the integers in the set of integers. One that we're missing is the integer of 2. Um, the equivalence class that 2 is a part of also contains integers such as 5, 8, uh, negative 1, negative 4, and so on. So now we've created another equivalence class to where if we pick any two of these integers and plug them in for a or b, we're going to show that a is going to be equivalent to b because a minus b is going to end up in the set of 3z. Now, um, with our equivalence classes, we've partitioned our set to where all of our sets are disjoint, and they contain the whole set of integers. So every integer is accounted for now. Now we want to know how to name our different equivalence classes. One way we could do this is to simply write out all the elements. If I wanted to name this equivalence class up here, I could write it as you know, a class that contains um, negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, 6, so on. But that takes um, a long time and that can get very sloppy. One easy way we can do that is we can just call it the equivalence class that contains zero and use brackets as our notation. So this means the equivalence class that contains zero, meaning that if we know zero is within this equivalence class, then we can generate all of the other integers that are going to be a part of that equivalence class because we know zero is a part of it. We could also name it as the equivalence class generated by three. Because if we know that 3 is a part of this equivalence class, we could generate all the other integers. So these two are actually equal to each other. Following that pattern, we could name this equivalence class, as the, um, just as an example, the equivalence class generated by 2. And then over here, we have the equivalence class that's going to be generated by 1. Another way that we can name our equivalence class is if we think about them in terms of cosets. Our first equivalence class is going to be just 0 plus 3z. All right. So that's another way we can name that coset. Down here we have um, a set of 2 plus 3z. And then over here we have 1 plus 3z. All right, so those are um, three different ways that we can name our cosets. We can either write it out longhand or simply um, just write it as the uh, equivalence class that contains a certain number. Um, if you want to think about it in terms of cosets, we can also do that. So we just finished talking about equivalence classes and equivalence relations. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the field of formal quotients, which is our second topic for the day. Field of formal quotients, notice that I have formal in quotation marks because it can also be referred to as fraction fields, field of fractions, quotient fields, as well as field of quotients. All right? I'm going to call it field of formal quotients, but the other four terms are synonymous with what I'm saying. All right? When we're talking about field of formal quotients, we're saying that every integral domain can be embedded in a field, and this field is what we call the field of formal quotients. To put that um, simpler and something that's easier to hold on to, our goal is to take a ring and we want to turn this ring into a field of formal quotients, meaning that we're trying to create a new field that has a subring that is isomorphic to the integral domain, and our field of formal quotients is going to contain multiplicative inverses, which we don't have in our ring. All right, the ring that we're going to look at is the ring of the, the set of integers under addition and multiplication, and our goal is to transform this ring into a field of formal quotients. As we do this, there's a couple things that we must do. First, we must define an equivalence relation between two terms in our field of formal quotients, or any two terms in our field of formal quotients. And we need to check to make sure that addition and multiplication are both well-defined in our field of formal quotients. All right, so the example that we're looking at is our ring Z defined under both addition and multiplication. Um, over here on the left-hand side, I've created our ring and some of the elements that are contained in our ring which is 1, 2, 3, 
Um, then I just have variables A, B, and C that represent any term that could be found within our ring. Notice in our ring, we have additive inverses. The additive inverse of 2 is going to be negative 2. The additive inverse of 3 is going to be negative 3. So within this ring, we have additive inverses. However, what we don't have are multiplicative inverses. And that's where a field of formal quotients comes in. We're looking to create a field that not only contains multiplicative inverses from our ring, um, uh, from the elements in our ring, but also has a subring that is isomorphic to our integral domain. All right, but the first thing is to make sure we have our multiplicative inverses. Multiplicative inverse of 2 is just going to be 1 over 2. All right. Multiplicative inverse of 3 is going to be 1 over 3. And then we can just go through um, 1 over A, just to write a few, 1 over B. All right, so now we have a field that will contain all of our multiplicative inverses. We also want to make sure that our field um, has a subring that's isomorphic to our integral domain, so we want to make sure we include all these elements as well. But notice over here, all these are written in the form of our rational numbers, so we need to do the same over here if we're going to include them. So we can rewrite 1 as the rational number of 1 over 1, or the um, integer of c is just going to be c over 1. Um, we can include 3 over 1, and so on and so forth. So now we have our field of formal quotients that not only has our multiplicative inverses, but also our subring that's isomorphic to our integral domain. Now I said that we wanted to do two things. The first thing was to find an equivalence relation. Um, and notice within our field of formal quotients, there are going to be rational numbers, and there are rational numbers, that are equivalent to each other. One third is also equivalent to the rational number of 2 over 6, which is going to be equivalent to the rational number of 3 over 9. So within our field of formal quotients, we have different equivalence classes. All right, so we need to define an equivalence relation. So, an equivalence relation um, to define the equivalence classes in our field of formal quotients is going to be for any A over B, um, or excuse me, when A over B is equivalent to C over D, when A times D is going to be equal to B times C. And that just comes from our cross multiplication of our two rational numbers. Now, since we have defined an equivalence relation, we want to make sure that all three properties are satisfied. The first one is our reflexive property. So if we just choose one of the elements, say one-third, one-third is going to be equivalent to one-third. Okay, three is going to be equal to three. Perfect. Our reflexive property works. The second one to check is a symmetric property. So if we take two elements from our equivalence class, we have uh, one-third is going to be equivalent to two-sixths. Okay, that means that six is equal to six when we plug that into our equivalence relation. And then if we go the opposite way, uh, 2, 6 is going to be equivalent to 1 third. Okay, still, 6 is equal to 6, so our symmetric property works. The last one to check is our transitive property, which says that, um, excuse me, 1 third is going to be equivalent to 2, 6. Okay, that means 6 is equal to 6. That works. 2, 6 is going to be equivalent to 3 ninths. Okay, 18 is equal to 18. That also works. So if we take our first and last terms, those must be equivalent to each other, right? And that's exactly what happens. 1 third is going to be equivalent to 3 nines, and we know that, and that means that 9 is equal to 9. So boom, we have our transitive property, and all three of these properties for our equivalence relation have been satisfied. So we have defined an equivalence relation for our field of formal quotients. The last thing that we need to do is make sure that addition and multiplication are both well-defined, that those operations are well-defined. Right. And as it turns out, addition is well-defined, and this is how we can define it. All right, for any a over b plus any m over n, a n plus b m, um, or it's going to be equal to a n plus b m all over b n, and that comes from finding a common denominator between the two rational numbers. Um, similarly, multiplication is also well defined. So we have for any c over d multiplied by any s over t, that means that uh, that's going to be equal to any. Uh, it's going to be equal to C times S all over D times T. And we know in our field of formal quotients, addition and multiplication, those two operations are both well-defined.